Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to call to order this meeting of the Summer Flounder Scup and Black Sea Bass Management Board. My name is Justin Davis. I'm the Administrative Commissioner from Connecticut and I'm currently serving as board chair. Uh, first up on our agenda this afternoon is approval of the agenda. Um, do we have any suggested additions to the agenda? And Tony, I'll ask if you yeah. could uh, track the no hands. hands. Let's just give it one second. No hands are raised. Great. We'll consider the agenda approved by consent. And moving on, the proceedings from this board's August 2021 meeting were provided in the meeting materials. Are there any additions or corrections to the proceedings from August 2021? No hands are raised. Great. We'll consider the proceedings from August 2021 approved by consent. Next up on the agenda is public comment. Is there any member of the public in virtual attendance who would like to make a comment on an item that is not on the agenda this afternoon? Uh, if you're on the phone and can't raise your hand on the webinar, just go ahead and speak out and we'll get your name down for public comment. I don't see any hands raised. Okay, moving right along here, great. Okay, next up, uh, we're going to have a presentation pertaining to 2022 recreational specifications. Uh, as a review of recent history, um, at the joint meeting of this board and the Mid-Atlantic Council last month, uh, the two bodies received information suggesting that a harvest liberalization was possible for summer flounder in 2022, and that conversely, comparison of the 2022 RHL and projected 2021 harvest suggested a harvest reduction was necessary for black sea bass. And after deliberating, uh, the two bodies passed like motions, uh, choosing to pursue conservation equivalency for those two species rather than implement a, implement a consistent set of coastwide measures uh, and to adopt measures that would achieve a 16.5% liberalization for summer flounder and a 28% harvest reduction for black sea bass. Uh, by virtue of taking that action, uh, the board and council initiated the Addendum 32 process. Uh, Addendum 32 was passed in 2018 and lays out a process by which states and regions will ultimately arrive at measures to, re uh, to achieve reductions or liberalizations. And so the step we're at in the process now is that the technical committee has been working on developing a methodology that states and regions can use to set measures and today we're going to hear a presentation on that methodology and we'll be asking the board to approve that. Uh, we're also going to receive some information about technical committee analyses that suggest we could possibly reconsider uh, the percent reduction necessary for black sea bass. So with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Dustin. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm just going to get my screen up and running. One second, I need to change the display. Sorry, hold on one second. All right. Now that I've got that squared away, sorry about that. Still dealing with this remote meeting and sometimes there's some challenges that come up, but thank you, Mr. Chair, for the overview. Um, I'll maybe make my recap of the background information a little bit shorter, um, but maybe some of you out there are visual learners, so perhaps having it up on the screen on a, on a slide will be helpful. So here's an overview of the presentation. Like I said, I'll be giving a background of the pertinent information. I'll cover a quick timeline according to the Addendum 32 process that um, the chair um, mentioned. Then I'll cover the TC recommendations on the methodology for adjusting 2022 recreational measures for summer flounder. And then following that, I'll give an update on TC progress 
on developing the standardized reduction tables for black sea bass. Then Jeff Brust will be helping me uh, by presenting on the Thompson Tau outlier analysis that the TC has been conducting on MRIP harvest data for black sea bass. And then there are a number of uh, issues here for board consideration, namely approving the methodologies for developing proposals and then discussing the outlier analysis and the, the various consequences of, of which approach is taken and how it relates to the council uh, as well. So as uh, Justin said, uh, back in December at the joint meeting, the board and council adopted CE or conservation equivalency for 2022 summer flounder and black sea bass recreational management. Um, for summer flounder, 2018 through 2021, uh, 2021 data was projected. Uh, that Those four years of data were used to compare to the 2022 recreational harvest limit, which uh, demonstrated that there was a, an ability to liberalize by 33% to uh, meet but not exceed the RHL. The board did take a more conservative approach uh, jointly with the council. They agreed that there were data uncertainties and there were some concerns um, about the stock status and, and the fact that it wasn't yet at the target. So they went with a more conservative approach of 16.5% liberalization. Then for black sea bass, also using 2018 through 2021 harvest data compared to the 2022 RHL, this indicated that a 28% reduction in regional measures was needed to uh, meet but not exceed the RHL. And then separately, I'll, I'll mention it here, I don't have many slides prepared on SCUP. Uh, the focus today will be black sea bass and summer flounder, but the board uh, and the council did jointly approve a one inch increase in the SCUP recreational minimum size for 2022. And this is expected to achieve a 33% reduction in harvest. So here's the timeline. Uh, like I said, I just covered what happened in December. And then following that meeting in January, the TC met twice to recommend guidelines for the states to use in developing their regional proposals. And then throughout this time and into February, states will be uh, going through their own public comment process um, uh, involving stakeholders and collaborating within the regions to develop the regional proposals for measures. Um, then here we are today, the January commission meeting where the board will hopefully approve a methodology for the states to use in developing the regional proposals. And then a tentative deadline of uh, February 2020, or February 21, excuse me, um, has been set for regions to submit their proposals. And then late February, the TC would meet again to review those proposals, um, look at the technical merit of the proposals and ensure that the liberalizations or the reductions uh, are expected to be achieved within each region. Then in early March, uh, staff would help set up a Summer Flounder Scuff and Black Sea Bass Board only meeting. Uh, this would likely be via webinar where the board would, re would review the proposals, uh, the TC recommendations, and they would hopefully establish a final set of measures for 2022. Then following on this, uh, commission staff uh, sends a letter to the regional administrator certifying that the board approved measures in combination will achieve but not exceed the RHL. So as Justin uh, alluded to, we're very much following the addendum 32 process. Um, and this pertains to both summer flounder and black sea bass. So I'll start with summer flounder. Uh, the addendum outlines that there are six regions, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut through New York, New Jersey, Delaware through, Virg through Virginia, and North Carolina. And that rec measures within all uh, states within a region should consist of the same size limits, bag limits, and season. Uh, this is unique to summer flounder. Um, and then also, uh, measures should be adjusted unidirectionally. So if there's a liberalization, it should be uh, equivalent across regions in one direction, and um, if there's a reduction, vice versa. So in addition to uh, states within a region being consistent uh, with their measures, uh, the addendum also uh, suggests that 
states should aim for minimal discrepancy in measures between bordering states. This kind of gets at the enforcement issue uh, and hoping to reduce confusion on, on state lines. So in addition to those criteria that have been outlined within the addendum itself, the TC did meet to make additional recommendations when putting forward a memo that was supplied uh, for supplemental materials. So the TC uh, said that states and regions should consider adjustments to bag, minimum or maximum size, as is now allowed, season, and as well as gear modifications. The TC specified that liberalization should be calculated in pounds and that recreational data should be pooled across 2018 through 2021, uh, but 2021 data should be included only if available or if it makes sense for the particular analysis, considering that we're still waiting on wave six data. Measures may be split by mode, uh, but it is very important here uh, that the pooling method still be applied, especially if you split uh, recreational harvest estimates down to the state, wave, and mode level, you might be dealing with PSE, PSEs that are quite high. Um, so the pooling approach hopefully will mitigate some of that. The TC also specified that non-compliant harvest data should still be assumed to occur under the new regulations. Um, for example, if someone has landed something way above the bag limit and it showed up in an intercept, uh, that level of non-compliance that ha has already been identified in previous years should be assumed to be carrying forward in, in the future year, 2022. So the TC also recommends calculating liberalization sequentially by measure change uh, to result in the cumulative expected uh, liberalization. So if that is not part of the proposals analysis and liberalizations are actually calculated independently, the following interaction equation should be used, whereby the total liberalization equals X plus Y so a change in measure uh, X and change in measure Y plus the product of those uh, percent changes. Um, said differently, uh, a lower minimum, minimum size increases harvest by 20% and a higher bag, bag increases harvest by 15%. We would expect the final increase in harvest to be 38%. And please note that the memo that was provided for supplemental materials had a typo in this numerical example for the interaction equation. Uh, the memo has since been updated to reflect that the combination of a 20 and a 15% liberalization would result in a cumulative 38% increase in harvest. And the TC has been provided with this updated uh, correction. So now moving on to addendum 32 as it applies to black sea bass. There are three regions for black sea bass, Massachusetts through New York, um, being the northern region, then we have New Jersey, and then the southern region, uh, Delaware through North Carolina. So addendum 32 specifies that the TC is tasked with providing a recommendation on how the coastwide harvest is distributed among the regions based on factors including resource distribution and expected availability, angler effort, prior year fishery performance, among other considerations. So the board then considers the recommendation and determines how the reduction is distributed. Also outlined in the addendum, states um, are to develop measures in a manner that ensures each state takes an equitable uh, reduction. And the board should reduce interregional differences between measures when possible, taking into account regional differences in availability. Uh, so, in terms of the regional uh, distribution of the reduction, uh, the TC recommends restrictions to recreational regulations for black sea bass be applied equally across those regions. And then within regions as already outlined in the addendum, uh, reductions should be considered equally. So it was, it was pretty much determined that each state should do their fair share and equal part. At least that's the TC's recommendation. Uh, the TC also recommends standardizing the reduction analysis to support coordination between the states within regions. Um, this hopefully will just expedite the process uh, and make it a little bit easier. 
So in response to the TC's own recommendation, they have begun collaborating. Um, a subset of the TC is in the process of developing tables to standardize the methodology for calculating reductions. Um, the final tables will apply the following criteria. Many of these criteria have already kind of been applied to uh, summer flounder, but the reductions should be calculated in pounds. The analysis uh, uses recreational data from 2018 through 2020. Uh, 2021 at this point is potentially being used to inform the length frequency distributions. And then like, the like was the case for summer flounder, um, the black sea bass reduction tables would assume non-compliance would remain in changes to new regulations. And then all the reductions in these uh, black sea, sea bass reduction tables are calculated sequentially. So in effect, this would preclude the need for the interaction equation that I presented on earlier. So each state will have its own standardized reduction table within an Excel document. This table would be shared and distributed amongst TC members, and the table calculates a daily harvest rate, the percent of harvest that occurs within each half inch bin by wave, and the percent of harvest that occurs under each bag limit by wave. So in this way, TC members will be able to adjust bag size and season by wave to determine the total projected reduction. This methodology has been used before uh, for summer flounder, and it's a lot of work up front to develop these tables, uh, but on the back end, in terms of adjusting measures, seeing how they interact with each other within regions, um, it really simplifies the process for being able to put forward the proposals and see uh, cumulatively what the reductions will look like. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the TC did look into um, black sea bass data a little bit more through their uh, reduction table analysis and just generally looking at MRIP harvest data. So Jeff Brust will be giving a presentation on that work. And I'd like to say a big thanks to him as well for working with Peter Clark on this. Um, it's definitely been a lot of work in a short amount of time. So uh, I think he owes all of our thanks and take away, Jeff. I can, I'm happy to click through the slides. Uh, just let me know when I should switch to the new one. Sure. Thanks, Dustin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Jeff Brust with New Jersey Marine Fisheries Administration. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm not technically, I'm not currently a member of the technical committee, but uh, staff asked me to come help with this analysis so that the TC members could focus on the work that they had, uh, that they had in front of them. So go ahead to the next slide, please, Dustin. So a little bit of background, and you've heard this a couple of times already today. Um, back in December, the board and council had a joint motion to reduce recreational black sea bass harvest by 28% to achieve the 2022 recreational harvest limit. Um, as Dustin just pointed out, uh, the TC was working to develop standardized methods to evalu evaluate the recreational management options. And while they were doing that, two things happened. Uh, one, we received updated 2021 harvest projections from MRIP. And as uh, TC was looking at the data, they noticed, no surprise, that there were some harvest estimates that seemed a little bit uh, out of the ordinary or out of context with some of the uh, other estimates from the same state year wave and, and mode. So both of these things that, that cropped up during their analysis could have an effect on the magnitude of the required harvest reduction that we need to take. Um, so if you go to the next slide, uh, Dustin, we can jump into that. So the first one is easy. Um, we had new harvest projections uh, uh, when the December, when, during the December meeting, uh, the staff memo uh, only had data through waves uh, one through four in 2021. So we made projections about what wave five and wave six would look like. Uh, since the uh, December meeting, uh, we have received wave five preliminary estimates. And with that, we can include those. We get rid of the wave five projection, replace it with the actual data. Uh, and now we only have to re-estimate wave six using waves one through five. And you can see in the plot at the bottom, um, the blue bars are what was presented uh, at the December meeting, and the orange bars are with the updated MRIP harvest estimates. Um, I do want to point out, you can see in the table on the right, that um, you'll remember that the staff memo suggested that there was a 28% reduction needed, uh, but staff calculated that reduction two different ways. One said it was a 27% reduction, one said it was a 28% reduction. 
Uh, for this uh, table, I'm showing you the 27 because the way that that was calculated is consistent with the way that we're looking at the data for the analysis we're looking at. Um, so bottom line is the reduction, uh, the, the, the new harvest estimates for 2021 have come down a little bit. Uh, it's looking like we won't need the full 28% reduction. 24.4 uh, might be a bit low based because of the, the methodology that was used, but you can see that it has come down from the previous estimate. Uh, next slide, Dustin. The next thing that we uh, that we noticed was, um, and we've all seen plots like this before. You know, it's MRIC data. It's it's variable. Uh, it's there's uncertainty and you know or you know uncertainty in, uh, instituted in the, the results through sample size, angular behavior, um, stock biomass, things like that. Um, but these are just some examples of um, the anomalous data that we we saw. Um, the the uh, the two top figures what look like uh, anomalously low harvest estimates for um, so we were looking at the data by state year wave and mode uh, and so the top two one's Massachusetts one is New Jersey uh, you can see that those two lowest values are very different from the the others the other years and then the bottom two figures are uh, what look like anomalously high estimates of harvest for those cells next slide so just looking at the data, you can't tell, are these real? Are they true outliers or are they just you know, uh, you know, expected variability? Um, but so one thing that some, some of the things that we were considering when, when looking at them, uh, for black sea bass, it's unusual that we have four years in a row where the uh, regulations remained relatively unchanged. So that works in our, in our favor. But because we have uh, regulations that were similar, we would expect the harvest to be very similar as well. Um, some things, as I mentioned before, some things that might affect the estimates would be stock abundance or availability, angler behavior. We did have a pandemic, so that might affect how folks are fishing, uh, which might affect the harvest estimates. Um, but in, in my mind, what's most likely here, particularly since the uh, outliers are happening at the cell level, at the you know, um, stock abundance might change, but it, probably wouldn't just change for two months in Virginia in the charter boat fishery. Um, it's more likely to be seen across multiple waves, multiple modes. Uh, same with angular behavior. It might, might um, I would expect to see changed, uh, you know, changes to harvest uh, because of changed angular behavior across wider um, times and spaces. So in my mind, the, the, the most likely uh, culprit here is small sample size. Uh, um, leading to anomalous values in the harvest estimates. Go ahead, next slide, please. So, again, just looking at the data is no, it isn't, it, you know, we can't confirm that it's an outlier. So what we wanted to do was uh, use a, a standardized method, um, something quantitative, something statistical to help us identify those outliers. And folks who've been on the board for a few years will remember that back in 2018, um, we did a similar analysis for New York and New Jersey party and charter boat estimates. Um, there were a couple of anomalous values that we were, uh, that the technical committee used a, a, a method called the modified Thompson's Tau analysis to identify those uh, and they smoothed them using a, a, a method called Windsorization. Next slide, please. So just very briefly on the Thompson's Tau analysis, it is a statistical method. Uh, it's based on the student's T distribution. Um, one benefit is it outlier, or it, excuse me, it identifies both high and low outlier values. And it has some flexibility that you can set what probability um, of, of detection you want to look for for an outlier. So maybe you want to chop off the, 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 the top and bottom 5% or 10% or maybe just 1% on each end. So you, you, can't, you do have some flexibility in what you define as an outlier. Next slide, please. So the Thompson style is helpful because it helps us identify outliers, but that's all it does. It just identifies the outliers. Um, then there's the question of what do you do with these outliers? Uh, depending on the analysis, you might just decide to keep them. Hey, it's good to know we have outliers, um, but in, in this instance, we wanted to try and smooth them uh, to help you know get better estimates of what our harvest would be. Uh, in some cases, you might remove the outlier entirely, 
we couldn't do that here. We know there was harvest. We can't just disregard entirely uh, an estimate of harvest for a certain cell. So the technical committee has been looking into ways to, once we've identified these outliers, replace them with something that seems more realistic in terms of what we've seen in the other years, given those same regulations. Again, though, um, there's lots of different options on how to do this. What we're looking for is an objective method, a repeatable method, um, and something that can be applied to all of the different, uh, all the different cells uh, equitably. So an objective method to determine how to replace those values. And we've looked at, I don't know, I probably looked at three dozen different ways of how to replace those values. Um, I will say that, you know, we're, we're narrowing in on it, uh, but we do not have a final answer on what we think that the, the, the best method should be. So this is still very much a work in progress. A couple of things that need to happen is you, we need more eyes on the analysis to make sure I've done everything correctly. We need to come up with the, the, the um, standards for how we're going to replace them and, and even what, what probability level we want to use to identify those values. Next slide, please. So real quick, jumping into more specifics of how we did this analysis. Uh, we used MRIP data from 2018 through 2021. Again, wave six for 2021 was projected information. We did the analysis at the state, year, wave, and mode level. This is consistent with how it was done in 2017. And also the uh, one benefit of doing it this way is once we identify those outliers and we replace them with what we think is a, a more reasonable estimate, um, those new values can be used in the state analyses to develop management options. So it's not just, hey, we've identified outliers, we're changing the harvest numbers, and then we're going to use the original raw data to do our analyses. No, we're taking these new results and plugging them into the analyses and so that they're carrying forward into, into what our regulations, or excuse, yeah, what our regulations should be. Um, if you go back, if think back to the, the normal distribution curve that I showed that had the orange tails, uh, we've looked at outliers at the 80, 90, and 95% probability. So for at the 80% probability, we truncated the 10% on either end of that distribution. At the 90th percentile, we truncated 5% off each side, and at the 95th, it was 2.5% on each side. So we've looked at three different probabilities for identifying outliers. For replacement, um, I think I've got six or eight different methods that we were looking at. Um, probability distributions that include or exclude the outlier value. So if we're looking to replace it, do we, for example, use uh, a, a median value that includes that outlier, or do we uh, just use a median value that does not include that outlier, just the three values that we think are, are, um, are appropriate, are realistic. Um, and then we also looked at a method that uses the next closest value. So if you have a high value, we don't believe that one, we use the next highest value. And we did that with scaling or without scaling. So that next highest value as it is, or maybe that next highest value plus 50%, because we, we don't want to cheat it down too far, but we know it's not as high as, as what the estimate is actually saying is. So again, we've looked at probably 24 different ways of doing this. Next slide, please. So real quick, some preliminary results. Uh, these tables show how many outliers were observed. Uh, the top table is by year. The middle table is how many outliers by wave. And the bottom is how many by mode. And you can see um, um, <laughs> thankfully, uh, most of the values that we see are, are, are good. They're not outliers. Um, and you, what you see is actually there were in most cases, more outliers that were on the low end than on the high end. Um, for 2020, for, for year, it looks like 2021 had the most outliers. Um, by wave, uh, wave three had the most, uh, and several had, had more than a dozen though. And by mode, um, it's pretty even across all of them. They are all in the, well, party, charter, and private all had 15 or so uh, outliers. Again, mostly on the low end uh, than the, uh, more on the low end than on the high end. Next slide, please. So go back to that first slide that I showed um, where we we visually ID'd what we thought might be outliers. Uh, these are the same four graphs um, with some of the replacement values that we're considering. Um, the blue lines are the original values. 
the orange line is the highest replacement value that that uh, we're considering that you know from the analysis that we've done so far the gray bar is the lowest replacement value uh, for each of these plots and you can see that you know when you have a high outlier um, the highest estimate doesn't change it too much the low end uh, does change it a lot for the low outliers the lowest value doesn't change it very much from the original the high value changes it much closer to uh, what the other three years are looking like next slide please uh, this top graph, um, it's showing the range of estimates. So the blue bar is the original harvest estimate. The, uh, the other colored bars are a handful of the different options that we're looking at. Uh, what I wanted to point out here actually is that for 2018, you can see that most of the replacement values are higher. So more than likely our 2018 value estimate of harvest is going to increase from what MRIP is telling us it is. For 2020, most of the values are lower than what the estimate, uh, the, the MRIP estimate is telling us. And then overall, the average harvest across all four years uh, tends to come down um, from about 8.8 .8 million pounds, anywhere, uh, you know, 8 million pounds. No, am I looking at that right? Yeah. So, yeah, the, 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 the original value was close to 8.9, almost 9 million pounds. Um, the replacement values range anywhere from 8.8 .8 million down to about 8.5 million. So somewhere in that range is probably where the, the average harvest is going to end up. And then the bottom graph there just shows the range of reductions that we might need depending on the, the, um, the final harvest estimate. Once we've replaced all the outliers, we are probably looking at a, um, a harvest reduction required somewhere between about 17 and a half, 18 percent maybe, and up to 24.6. The 24.6 is the, the reduction that we would need if we didn't replace any. So remember the 2021 harvest estimates have been updated and that table alone showed that we only need about a 24 and a half, 25 percent reduction. All the other plots to the, or all the other points to the right of that one value are looking at different ways of replacing the outliers. And so it ranges from about 23 and a half down to about 17, 18%, something like that. So uh, next slide, please. I believe that's it. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, for the presentation. Uh, before we get into questions, I kind of just sure. wanted to outline a few items uh, that are ready for board consideration. I know we've given a lot of information here, but I hope this might help frame the discussion. So first, I presented on the criteria that the TC has recommended for use in the development of regional proposals for black sea bass and summer flounder recreational measures. Uh, the board could approve that criteria today, either through consensus or through a motion, uh, if consensus is not reached. And then second, Jeff has presented on the TC's ongoing analysis of black sea bass MRIP estimates. So in light of this analysis, the board could vote to rescind the December 2021 black sea bass recreational management motion. This would allow the TC to further discuss the Thompson Tau outlier analysis and make a recommendation for how the outlier values are replaced which in turn would result in a recommendation for a new reduction percentage target for black sea bass. So if the board did go this route, I've just outlined in red here some additional steps that would kind of enter into that timeline. So the board again has the option to rescind the December motion. The TC then has the option to, or the board has the option to task the TC with reviewing this analysis and recommending a new percentage reduction for black sea bass. If that's the route the board takes, then the council would have to consider rescinding the December motion at their February 8th council meeting, because this is a joint FMP. And then if all of that continues um, as outlined, uh, the board would then consider the TC analysis and uh, approve a new reduction percentage target uh, for black sea bass. And this could be resolved via email vote, a webinar meeting, or the board could just defer to whatever the TC recommends. Um, so yeah, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, you, Mr. Chair, for directing any questions about what's been presented, and then hopefully we can get into a, a comprehensive discussion. 
Great. Thanks very much, Dustin. And uh, thank you, Dustin and Jeff, for those presentations. And thanks to Commission staff and all the members of the Technical Committee who have been working really hard over the last month since the last meeting on all of this analysis. Um, certainly appreciate all the hard work there. At this time, I'll open it up to the board for any questions about either the either of the presentations that were just made or about the information Dustin presented on potential path forward from this point. Uh, Tony, do we have any hands? I will give you, excuse me, a cue. I have Shanna Madsen, Jason McNee, and Nicola Meserve. Okay, go ahead, Shanna. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Jeff, for this presentation. I think it was really comprehensive and it answered a lot of the questions that I had as I was uh, watching the TC deliberations. Um, we'd have a quick question uh, regarding the last, if we could go back to the last slide you showed before this one. You mean the timeline slide? Uh, no, one before that. Sorry, Dustin, the one with the graphs, number 22. Okay, yeah, here we go. Perfect, thank you. Um, so Jeff, the question I had was, so it sounds like the TC needs some time to deliberate um, setting the probability level of detection as well as the replacement analysis. So my question was regarding um, these points along this reduction required chart. Are those um, a range based on the probability level of detection? Are they based on what replacement method you might end up using? I'm just wondering what the different variables are here that are going into generating um, these levels of reduction. So that's a good question, Shanna. Thank you. Um, it's a, there's really no rhyme or reason to this figure other than I sorted them high to low. Um, you can see, and I, I think what's maybe important, and I should have pointed it out before, is that um, this this looks at all three uh, probability levels, so the 0.8, the 0.9, and 0.95, um, and you can see that a lot of the different values are falling out right around that 21, 21 and a half percent range. Um, so there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of consistency in the results, depending on, you know, even though we're looking at different methodologies. Um, but yeah, no, this, this, doesn't, this doesn't necessarily um, show all the ones on the left are the 0.95 and all the ones on the right are the 0.8. Um, I, I can't say that equivocally. It's, I just sorted it high to low. Great, thanks, Jeff. That that helps um, that helps me kind of figure out where the consistency might be there. I appreciate it. Okay, next up, I have Jason McNamee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, really great work. Uh, it brings me back, uh, and it's uh, great to hear your voice. Um, so it's funny, Shanna asked the question that I was going to ask, but I still am confused. Um, so hoping you can help me out. Uh, so um, staying on the slide, my question is, do each of these dots represent kind of a different, I understand what's changing with regard to the um, chosen probabilities, but are there different methods uh, incorporated in here as well? So does each dot represent a unique method along with a choice of probability? Is that is that what these are? Yeah, Jay, good question. Um, so as I said before, this this covers all three probabilities of uh, excuse me, of identification for the outliers. And then yeah, so each dot would then be a different replacement value or different replacement method applied to each of those three uh, identification probabilities. So um, just to give you an idea, the, some of the uh, options that we looked at were replacing it with the 95th value of the, uh, the 95th percentile of all four um, values for that cell or just the, the 95th percentile of the three, quote, acceptable values from that cell. 
Um, or, you know, another one would be replacing it with the median or replacing it with the median scaled up or down, depending if it's a high or low value. Uh, so yes, each dot is, is a combination of an identification probability and a replacement method. The only one that is not is the one all the way to the left. Like I said, that is the revised uh, harvest estimate from 2021, or excuse me, it incorporates only the revised harvest estimate from 2021. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was perfect. Appreciate it. Okay, next up, Nicola Meserve. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Dustin and Jeff for your presentations and, and the technical committee, um, you know, digging into this evaluation with a short turnaround. Um, could could we just go to the timeline slide for my first quick question, I think. Um, so I, I wanted to get confirmation that it, we expect that the TC will be recommending that new percent reduction by the time of, of the council meeting on February 8th. Is that correct? Is that the expectation? Yeah, good question, Nicola. I've been polling the TC um, to see when they'd be able to meet. It's looking like early next week would be the TC's preferred date. Um, so assuming that we could get this settled in one meeting, I would expect that we would have a new TC recommendation prior to the council meeting on February 8th. Okay, uh, thank you. Nicola, I just wanted to, I think this, this timeline is a little off in the sense that we need to have a recommendation prior to the council meeting. Um, and so it, I think if, if the board does, rescind the motion then we would need to have a discussion about how to get that new recommended value formally adopted yes exactly okay okay thank you um and and i had a second question mr chair if you don't mind um regarding the uh, the standard methodology for state proposals um i noticed that um the technical committee didn't make a specific you know recommendation about um, PSEs associated with the data that's going to be used although Dustin you did bring it up in your presentation um, and you know absent of the the TC setting some standard I was going to you know ask at least that the state proposals be required to present um, PSEs associated with the data particularly when it's broken down at a at a mode level for example is that is that part of the the format Dustin Yeah, I'm just double checking the memo itself. Um, because in my mind, I thought that was in included, but you know what, it may not have gotten into the final version, but I think that's definitely worth including. Um, yeah, there's, yeah, there's some discussion about pooling in high PSC values. Um, but we certainly can amend the memo that was sent out for supplemental materials and in the requirements for state submit or region submitting the proposals, we can say that it's a requirement to include the PSC values. If that's okay. okay. Yes, thank you. I think that would be, you know, informative for the for the board when they eventually review the proposals. Okay, next up in the queue, I have Emerson Hasbrook. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Justin, uh, Dustin and Jeff for your presentations. Um, I have two questions for Jeff. Um, Jeff, in your presentation, you said that there's probably six to eight different methods to determine what the best replacement value is gonna be for these outliers. So I'm wondering, <laughs> Uh, so I'm wondering, um, um, how is it going to be determined what the best replacement value is? That's my first question. That's a good question, Emerson. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, I can't tell you what the, the the TC discussions are going to result revolve around, um, but you know certain things like, um, you know, maybe. PSEs or sample size, um, 
there might be some that we, you know, even though it's identified as an outlier, maybe we don't want to replace it. Uh, for example, if we have three years with a zero and then a positive year, maybe we don't want to re replace that one. There's just going to, they're going to have to, you know, fine tune this analysis and consider um, the different caveats of the different uh, assumptions that I made during this analysis. Um, perhaps a median is is too much of a change and we want to replace it with some other percentile from the, the observed distribution. So I, I, if, if I had an answer, if I knew the, the best way to do it, uh, I think this analysis would be done, but uh, certainly needs um, a, a, the whole committee's eyes and, and, and brains working on this one. Okay, thank you. So that's going to be fleshed out in, in the next TC meeting and, and I guess my consensus of the TC. Um, so my, my second question was, um, there's probably similar outliers for fluke and scup, and I'm wondering if those species were also looked at for um, outliers like this? So I'll take a shot at that, and then I'll pass it over to, to staff, see if they want to add to this. This is something that I, um, I spoke to Tony about, um, and for... Um, for the sake of time, and uh, we, we focused on black sea bass because, uh, well, we needed to start somewhere. And also uh, because fluke is a liberalization this year, um, for one thing, it, it seems like when we do this outlier analysis, the, the, the overall trend is that the harvest estimates come down. And since fluke is already taking, um, fluke is already currently under the RHL and we're looking at a liberalization, seemed like it was less necessary to reduce that harvest. Um, as far as SCUP, uh, I'm not too familiar with that. Uh, I, Tony was mentioning that perhaps someone will look at it, but it's not something that I was asked to do. So uh, that's my initial response. I don't, I'll kick it over to Dustin or Tony to see if they have any additional thoughts. Yeah, Jeff, I think that was a good response. Um, it, perhaps even further to, uh, to support your statements about summer flounder, the board had the ability to go with a 33% liberalization, but ended up uh, taking a more conservative approach and going with a 16.5% liberalization. So it's unlikely that an outlier analysis um, would result in something uh, that would you know, ultimately change the board's decision, considering that that more conservative approach has already been taken. Um, and then for SCUP, uh, it was kind of a timing thing at this point why we were only able to do it for black sea bass. It can definitely be done for SCUP and if it's uh, at the board's discretion or, or if they'd like to uh, task the TC with uh, developing a similar outlier analysis for SCUP that can probably be done prior to the council's uh, February 8th meeting. Okay, you good, Emerson? Yes, I am, thank you. Okay, next up I have John Maniscalco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I'd like to thank Jeff Rust and Pete Clark and any other state or commission staff uh, that worked on this. Um, I think it's it's great. Uh, during my tenure, we started looking at Thompson Tau, but we never kind of looked at looked at all the estimates so holistically uh, and addressed both highs and lows. Um, so this is, uh, this is a really great step forward. I was wonder, wondering how easy it would be to replicate uh, for all, 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 all the species. And it looks like you, you mostly answered that question. Um, and uh, I would certainly support this being done for SCUP uh, if, you know, if the, the TC isn't, isn't already overtasked. Thank you. Okay, next up I have Chris Bat Savage. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was muted by the organizer. Um, and thank you, uh, Jeff, uh, for, for the presentation. Um, I thought I heard you say that um, that 
you know, with the uh, you you accounted for the um, high <clears throat> anomalously high estimates and the low estimates, and it seemed like the uh, you know, the higher estimates had more of an influence uh, regarding what the adjusted um, harvest amount would be. Uh, the graph that's <clears throat> up on the uh, up on the screen right now, the top left, um, it where it shows a range of, of possibilities. Uh, is that is that kind of showing where you know there would be a higher influence by just the the, the higher you know the high estimates versus the low? Because I was thinking about when this was done several years ago, uh, we just adjusted the the high ones and didn't uh, look at the low ones. I'm um, just trying to make sure I'm understanding you know the the, the range of options here. Uh, considering the fact that um, that the anomalously high estimates uh, seem to have more of an influence uh, than than those low estimates. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Good question. Um, so, yeah, and the 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 couple of weeks that I've been looking at this, it does appear that even though there were more low outliers identified, the impact from the high estimates uh over uh, you know outweighed those and dustin if you can go up i think just one slide uh i don't know if folks can can zoom in and, and see this but just as an example um you know so the 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 top right the new jersey private rental wave five you know the the in 2019 the original estimate is twenty five thousand. And it's getting bumped up anywhere to about 30,000 to 150,000. So, you know, it's, it's bumping up like 125,000 pounds, which is a lot. But if you look at the lower right, you know, that estimate, that high estimate in 2021 is going from 500,000 uh, 500, down to as low as about 50,000. So that one high outlier is moving a lot more than, you know, several low outliers would collectively. So um, it, that's not always the case. Like, if, Dustin, if you could go to, back to the next slide, um, you can see that in 2018, the overall movement was a higher estimate of, of harvest. Uh, so the blue line all the way to the left is the original. And pretty much all of the, the replacement values are higher than that. So in some cases, you do get higher estimates of harvest. But in general, it looks like the overall pattern is that uh, for a given cell, the the direction you know that the magnitude is decreased. Follow up, Chris. Or are you good? I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So at this time, I don't have any more hands for questions. I think Listen. what I'm going to. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, sorry, Tony. Justin. Uh, Roy Miller just raised his hand. Okay, Roy Miller, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The obvious question from this is when do we apply um, this methodology to deal with outliers and uh, anomalous results? Do we only do it when we have to take a harvest reduction? Do we do it when we have to take uh, or, or when we're allowed to take a harvest liberalization? And uh, what's the triggering level that, that uh, precipitates this type of analysis? I'm just wondering going forward uh, for future results, if, if there can be some guidance that comes out of this process. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I could try to help out with that answer. Please do, Tony. Thank you. So Roy, what I would say is that the work that we're trying to do through the um, harvest control rule addendum that utilizes some of the models approaches for setting recreational measures would um, greatly help out with this and um, find ourselves using additional sources of information and data for setting recreational measures where this wouldn't even need to be a consideration anymore. Um, as you know, for Black Sea Bass, for the last four years, we've had status quo measures and kept them in place. So there really hasn't been much thought to the MRIP data and, and analyses such as this. We've done the same for summer flounder and scup. Um, and really, the last time we changed summer flounder me measures 
we did use this um, type of analysis approach back in 2017. So it is my hope that through this harvest control rule addendum that we're working on, we won't need to take this into consideration anymore and we'll have a new approach. Thank you. Um, that would eliminate uh, this dilemma of when to apply it. Okay, thank you, Tony. Do we have any more hands at this point for questions? I do not have any additional hands. Okay, so in the interest of time, we've got about a half hour left in our uh, agenda, a lot of time today. I think I'm gonna ask the board to move to potentially taking action on the one piece of business before us today that I think is definitely going to require a motion. And that is, uh, as Dustin discussed, the potential need to rescind the motion that was adopted at the December joint board and council meeting and adopt a new motion that would allow essentially the board to operationalize this analysis that's been done and that is continuing to be worked on by the technical committee that could potentially adjust the overall percent reduction that is required for CBAS. So at this point, I'll turn to the board and ask if there's any board member who might be willing to make a motion uh, concerning that action item, and that could help sort of focus the discussion going forward. You have Shanna Madsen with her hand up. Okay, Shanna, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I am willing to make a motion to that point. Um, I believe staff might have a motion, but if not, I'm willing to just go ahead with it. Yep, there we go. <laughs> so um, we've got move to rescind the December 2021 Black Sea Bass Recreational Management Motion and move to adopt conservation equivalency for 2022 Black Sea Bass Recreational Management with a reduction in harvest specified to achieve the coastwide RHL in 2022. A 28% reduction will be required unless additional analyses conducted by the technical committee examining the MRIP data, including the outlier analysis and incorporation of the updated 2021 data as presented today, result in a modified percentage. Non-preferred coastwide measures are as follows, the 14 inch minimum size, five fish possession limit and open season of May 15th through September 21st. Precautionary default measures are 16 inch minimum size, three fish possession limit and open season of June 24th through December 31st. If the per percent reduction is changed, the precautionary default and coastwide measures will be adjusted to be consistent with the required adjustment. Hey, thank you. So we have a motion on the board from Shanna Madsen. Do I have a second? We have Nicola Meserve. Okay, motion seconded by Nicola Meserve. Any discussion on the motion? We have Joe Samino with his hand up. And I don't know if you wanted to go to the maker of the motion first or not, if she has any comments. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, Shanna, I'll turn to you to ask first if you want to provide any rationale for the motion. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Tony. Yeah, I'd be happy to provide rationale. Um, I think I've been following the TC uh, work really closely. I appreciate all the work that Jeff's been doing for the TC um, to get this uh, analysis ready for this meeting today. I think the analysis that's been done combined with those updated 2021 harvest projections and the apparent anom uh, anomalies that we saw in some of those harvest estimates have really led me to um, want to make this motion today and to support seeing what the TC can do uh, with these methods that they're proposing. Um, I think that I take good comfort in the fact that uh, this has been done previously and it's consistent with uh, what the board has approved um, for the 2018 year dealing with the New York and New Jersey party charter. Um, so I look forward to seeing what the TC comes back with in February. Thank you. 
Thank you, Shanna. And Nicola Meserve, I'll turn to you to ask as the seconder of the motion if you'd like to provide some additional rationale. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think Shanna covered it very well. Um, I would just add that yeah, I would be interested to see the, a similar exercise for for SCUP and, and Fluke potentially. Um, you know, I think we're looking at a potential closure of um, federal waters for SCUP based on the reduction that we chose at the last meeting. So um, it's potential that this, um, you know, appropriate digging into the MRIP data could um, potentially reduce that burden as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Um, and at this time, I'll turn to Joe Semino, if you still have your hand up. Yep, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I think something that Jeff showed was that even just um, using the, the same prediction methods that, that the new MRIP estimates would, would, would change that percentage a little bit. So that alone is enough reason for me. But, you know, I, this is tough, like Jeff and Jay and, and, and John and others, I was I was part of the group, part of the TC that used to, to try and do these predictions, and it's 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 tough just using point estimates uh, from other years, and and it's it's something that impacts people's lives. So, yeah, you know, I, I really support this as a tool moving forward to help us with with future projections and staying within the RHL. Thanks a lot. Hey, thank you, Joe. Next up, I have Chris Bat Savage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I support the motion for the reasons given. Um, also, uh, depending on you know where the harvest control rule ends up, uh, maybe you know this won't this type of exercise uh, won't be needed as much. Um, uh, but it's but it's a good tool to have. I think ideally, um, if because uh, sample low sample size seemed to be uh, one of the issues uh, resulted in these outliers, that uh, if we could get more MRIP intercepts. Uh, you know, at the state wave and mode level to kind of reduce the need for for these type of um, you know analyses to to deal with outliers would would be the best situation but but absent that I think uh, what what's being proposed here is uh, is appropriate for boxy best thanks thank you Chris next I have Jason McNamee Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just um, adding uh, my voice to the mix here and, and support for the motion um, and also to support um, uh, what Nicola offered. I, you know, I think there are potential flags uh, in SCUP as well that, um, you know, uh, outlier looking data points, that sort of thing. So I, I think this would be valuable for uh, SCUP as well. I, I don't feel as compelled to do it for um, summer flounder for the reasons Dustin offered um, before. And, and it's not that we shouldn't be following a systematic approach. It's more um, about um, kind of, you know, efficiency and, and sort of operating in, in the fisheries that needed and, and kind of circling back uh, into um, Joe Semino's point, I, I agree, kind of investigating. And, and this is one approach. I think there are others um, that could be investigated as well. So once we get kind of out of the heat of the moment, you know, this is a good approach. It's tractable. Folks can understand it. Um, once we get uh, away from that, kind of investigating these approaches um, in a more comprehensive manner, um, you know, without a view of the species or anything like that, I, I think would be a, another thing worth um, investing in. So uh, thanks for the time, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Jason. Tony, do we have any more hands in the queue? Mike Luisi. Okay, Mike Luisi, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll, I'll speak in support of this motion. I think it's a good, uh, it's a good way forward. I would recommend uh, in in the future if we can keep this in mind uh, when we set when we when we meet jointly with the council in December that we may want to think about a similar type of motion that doesn't that doesn't bind us um, to a certain percent reduction uh, so that this type of analysis can be conducted without having to go back and go through the motions of or the, jump through the hoops to rescind 
uh, and provide a new motion uh, for consideration, just something to keep in mind. Uh, I do have a question about SCUP. If there is an interest in doing that analysis for SCUP and the process that, that has been laid out where the council would take this under consider, the council is gonna need to take these motions or this motion and any other motion made uh, under consideration in two weeks, would there need to be a similar motion for SCUP and so that the council would have an opportunity to address the previous motions from December at the February meeting? Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. And I think I'm gonna defer to Tony here and uh, her opinion on whether or not we might need to take up a similar motion here for SCUP uh, to allow some sort of follow on action that deviates from the motion we adopted in December. Thanks, Justin. So Mike, with SCUP it's a little different because we don't have the conservation equivalency process like we do with summer flounder and black sea bass. Um, and I feel like we're in a strange a situation that we've not been in before where the required reduction was higher than what the the board and council put in place for measures. And so we already aren't, we already did not bound ourselves to the reduction that came out of uh, the analysis of last year's harvest to, or the average of the last couple of years harvest to the, RR, to the 2022 RHL. On the commission side, I think we have the flexibility to make these changes and look at the analysis of the of the Thompson Tau and perhaps provide a letter to NOAA if it comes out with something different or for the board to discuss, hey, if you do the analysis, the required reduction would, let's say it's like, 40% and the measures that you guys have in place right now is 38%, then does the board wanna take action to find those other 2% or is there information that we can provide to NOAA for their consideration of the federal water measures that would get us um, on the same page? Um, I don't know if NOAA would need both bodies to change the motions or not, since the motions were not something that was favorable from NOAA Fisheries at the joint meeting. So I guess I would have a, that question to Mike Pentney, is if both bodies would have to change that motion or not. Me, Mr. Chairman? Sure, go ahead, Mike, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's an open question right now. Um, <clears throat> the, the motion adopted, as, as Tony was just describing, the motion that just was, adopt, was adopted in December calls for a 10 inch total minimum length for SCUP to achieve a 33% reduction in harvest. I think if there was, um, an outlier analysis done that showed <clears throat> something less than 33% reduction was necessary, then yes, I think you would, just like the board and potentially the council are doing here for Black Sea Bass, you would need new motions by both bodies to address what level of reduction is desired or required um and what measure is it not a 10 inch minimum size or something else um and but if it falls somewhere between 33 and um what's already you know what we would argue is already required based on the data um then there's no change to the motion necessary because you're still in the same place if that makes sense Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I could just follow up with that. Yep, go ahead, Mike. It makes it makes sense. I just 
um, in thinking about the next couple of weeks in uh, in our preparation for finalizing these recommendations, I I want to be sure today that we don't miss we don't miss a step uh, because of timing and because of uh, the council's work with the board on this. I want I just don't want to miss a step along the way and then be stuck. Um, that's that's kind of where my mind is. I certainly support this, and it sounds like from what Mike just said that we might need to take up a motion on SCUP. So we're not so specific about the percent reduction, and if an analysis is different from that, then we have the ability to modify that. I'm I'm still a little confused as to what we might do, but I hate to I don't want to deflect from the motion before us, so. Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to take this motion up and then try to get some more clarity uh, on the SCUP issue if, if that makes if that's more clear at this time. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And I think that is what I'm going to advise at this point is uh, for the board to deal with the motion we have in front of us here um, without getting too sidetracked at this point on the SCUP issue. But we can take that back up after we dispense with this motion. Um, Tony, do we have any other hands up? No additional board members, but you do have one member of the public. Okay, I'll recognize that member of the public at this time. It's Bill Pappas. Hey, Bill, hi. go ahead. Hi, hi guys. Thank you everybody for putting in your hard work and uh, look, re-looking at this CBAS. I also support this uh, motion to rescind the, the December thing. And I, I kind of, as a, as a charter captain in Virginia Beach, I'd like to tell you what you guys have directly, how you directly have affected our livelihoods in, a, in only a few short sentences. Uh, you know, I, I work with the NOAA and I do the charter input seminar, the two hour webinar at night. I've been doing that for, for a little while now. And we we're also wondering and the consensus is, is why it, it, if just say, for example, we, we got it wrong and there's a healthy fishery and there's twice as many fish out there and you haven't considered chips, technology, the amount of people fishing because of COVID and the extra amount of fish that can be found that there might be more fish pushing your numbers that you have as set as a cap. A little higher than they should be and making you feel like there's a reduction in a healthy fishery if you guys want the best numbers you're not going to use your small sample sizes you're going to talk to the vtrs and the charter captains you're going to use their numbers they're out there five to seven days a week they have their numbers available and instead we put a reduction in december which scared our vmrc into shutting down the only thing we have to fish for for four months in virginia sea bass in february they won't even offer or try now because they've already had their meeting and they've determined by your 28 percent that they're not going for a february at all my mate just had a baby my family's on the line i made eight nine thousand dollars in february which is more than enough to space out for three or four months you got it wrong here you know there's recreational reform on the way everybody's admitted there's not enough time on this so at the last second, with no time, we reduced, we scared, we shut down, and there's no rep, there's no turning around now. We don't have a VMRC that's willing to stand for us, and it's all we got left. So we appreciate you guys rescinding this motion. We actually are looking forward to a change if there is recreational reform that's being spoken about, and we need to get the best numbers to make our decisions because you guys are loving the numbers. But you got to have the right ones to make the decisions that really affect the livelihoods of the people at the other end of the stick. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much for that perspective. Appreciate the comment. Um, Tony, unless we have more hands at this point, uh, I think what I'd like to do is provide a 60 second caucus, one minute for the board, and then we'll come back and take a vote on this motion. Um, I just want to confirm, Luisi, your hand is up from before. Yeah. Okay. That is fact. Okay. And just, um, Justin, just as a reminder to the board before they caucus that this, because this is making a change to a final action and, um, this requires a two thirds majority vote to pass. Right. Thanks for that reminder, Tony. Okay. At this point, we'll have a one minute caucus and then we'll come back and vote.
Okay, does any board member need more time to caucus? If you do, please raise your hand. I have one hand up. Okay, why don't we provide an additional minute? Okay, unless any board member feels like they need additional time, I'm gonna go ahead and call the question here. Uh, Tony, do we need to read the motion into the record again? The motion did not change, so no need to read it into the record again. Okay, good news there. All right, so at this point, uh, I'll ask everyone in favor of the motion to please raise your hand. I'm just going to give the hands a moment to settle. And I have Maryland, Massachusetts, Virginia, North Carolina, Rhode Island, New York, Delaware, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Potomac River Fisheries Commission. And I will put the hands down for everyone. In a second, my, all right, I'm Icon ready. 11 in favor. Okay, anyone opposed to the motion, same sign. I have no hands raised. Any null votes, please raise your hand. I have no hands raised. Any abstentions? I have no officiaries. Okay, by my count, the motion passes 11 to zero with one noted abstention from NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service. Okay, moving on, um, it occurs to me that, you know, before we potentially consider any motion around SCUP uh, and rescinding the motion from December relative to that species, uh, there's been several comments on the record today from board members supporting the idea of the technical committee working on a Thompson's Tau analysis for SCUP. Uh, I, I think is it, it's safe to say at this point, and here I'm asking Dustin and Tony and, uh, you know, perhaps Jeff, is it is it, safe to assume at this point that the technical committee will be undertaking that analysis? Yes, it is safe to say they will be taking that under and starting it up. Okay, great. Um, so given that, uh, at this point, I think we have to consider whether we might want to consider a motion to rescind the December 2021 motion around SCUP. Um, Tony, at this point, I guess I would turn it to the board and ask if uh, anyone has any comments on that potential action or potentially a motion. I have John Maniscalco with his hand up. 
Okay, John Maniscalco, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I, I'm still a little confused why we actually have to. Um, I, I certainly want to see the um, analysis for SCUP. Um, you know, the I think the federal expectation was a 56% reduction. So far, the board and council agreed to a one inch increase in minimum size, which is uh, approximately a 33% reduction. Um, so, I, if the states move forward with a one inch increase in minimum size, uh, and we have the SCUP analysis done, doesn't that just support, it, you know, so, you know, and assuming that the change in the uh, required reduction identified decreases, doesn't that just further support um, the one inch minimum size increase and um, gives NOAA the ability to not take additional action in federal waters? I don't necessarily know why we have to do a, another motion and why we need to rescind the previous action if we still intend to go forward with a one inch minimum size increase. Um, so I'll just leave that as my question. Thank you. Thanks, John. Tony, do you have any perspective on that? I think so. If I'm understanding what Mike Pitney just said to the board is the only reason why you would need a motion to rescind is if we got a analysis that showed us we needed less than a 33% reduction. And so I, I, I mean, I can't speak for what the analysis is going to show, but I would think, you know, I'm not sure we would get that low. Uh, Mike Penny has his hand up, so I'll let him correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, Mike Penny, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. No, I think that's right. I mean, you know, and if if the the motion, as was just described, the motion is for a one inch increase in the minimum size. So, at what point would the council and the board decide that that one inch increase in the minimum size is no longer warranted? Um, probably not a 32% reduction needed or a 31%. You know, it's where does that line fall that um, maybe instead of a one inch increase in minimum size, you go for a half inch or something or, or no increase in minimum size. So um, I think the, the likelihood of this analysis going from a 56% reduction necessary down to something so low that you'd rethink that one inch minimum size increase is probably pretty, the likelihood of that is probably pretty small. I think what's more likely is that the 56 um, becomes something, you know, less than that, which um, a letter to us informing of us, uh, informing the agency of the results of that analysis and what the new reduction um, might be would inform, as, as Tony just said, would inform the action that we decide we need to take um in federal waters but would be unlikely to affect the action that the states are taking um under the board's plan i hope that helps thank you mike that is helpful and from my perspective uh, just i'm not seeing a need for a motion here to rescind the scup motion from december i think What's evident is that there is value in doing the Thompson's Tau analysis for SCUP because it might provide us new perspective on what level of conservation we're achieving with the measure we approved in December, the one inch minimum length increase. Uh, but it's it's very unlikely that the Thompson Tau analysis is going to uh, sort of provide such drastic new information that we would decide that that one inch minimum length increase is essentially more of a reduction than is necessary. So. Um, I'll still open it up here to the board. If anyone is interested in making a motion, please raise your hand. But at least from my perspective, I'm convinced based on the input we just got that that motion is not necessary. I have no hands. Okay, so moving on from that, I think one outstanding piece of business here is that we need to approve the technical committee's uh, suggested methodology for uh, estimate or for determining state and regional measures for summer flounder and black sea bass. 
Uh, I think we could potentially do that by consent. Um, I'm not sure a motion is needed. That uh, methodology was described uh, in a memo provided in the meeting materials and also at the beginning of Dustin's presentation. Uh, at this point, I'll just open it up to the board if there's any questions about the methodology, uh, if there are any lingering concerns or uncertainties around that, uh, please raise your hand. I have no hands raised. Okay, I think at this point then I would ask uh, if we can have board consent to approve the methodologies suggested by the technical committee. If there's anyone who objects to that, uh, please raise your hand at this time. I have no hands raised. Okay, so we'll consider the TC's methodology approved by consent. And I think moving on, one uh, last item, Tony, might be to outline sort of next steps here for the board to consider based on the actions taken today, sort of what might need to happen in the coming weeks before the next council meeting in the first, or I guess that's the second week of February, and, and what remaining decision points we might have here about what path to take. Thanks, Justin. Um, so by rescinding the motion um, and the fact that the TC has not completed their analysis for for black sea bass and what they would recommend as a um, final required percent reduction, um, we need to determine how the board wants to approve that final percent reduction. We do need to do that before the council meeting next Thursday, and so there's what I see, um, I guess, three possible paths. One, the board can defer that sort of decision or say that, you know, whatever the technical committee recommends is what the board would use and for the states to put in their, use for their proposals for their 2022 measures. So just leaving it to the TC recommendation the second path forward is we can provide a report via email to the board, and then the board could vote on that final percent reduction via an email vote, or we can attempt to set up a conference call between now and the council meeting to finalize that measure. I recognize that the New England Fishery Management Council is next week, so that could be a little bit tricky. We'd have to be pretty flexible on schedules for that. It sounds like the TC is going to meet at the beginning of next week, so maybe the board could meet at the end of next week if we needed to have a call to do that. But those are our three paths forward. Thanks, Tony. Just to clarify, you mentioned next Thursday. Is that so that would be the 3rd of February. Is that a deadline by which we need to have made a decision on the target uh, percent reduction? Sorry. I didn't mean next Thursday, uh, the council meeting on Thursday. So I think- Tony, it's uh, Tuesday, February 8th. The, the council meeting says Tuesday, February 8th. Sorry about that. Okay. We mixed up. So, you know, it seems to me the decision point here is whether the board wants to leave it in the hands of the technical committee to make a recommendation on the most appropriate target percent reduction and then leave that as the default and states and regions will engineer their proposals towards that percent reduction or if the board wants to take some positive action uh, between now and the council meeting to approve the percent reduction uh, suggested by the technical committee. Uh, at this point, I'll, I'll open it up to the board and ask if any board members have perspectives on this question of sort of which which path to take here. I'm waiting for hands. I have Nicola Meserve. Okay, Nicola Meserve, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was going to suggest that we take the the email vote option. Um, we saw, you know, a, a pretty thorough presentation today of the approach that the technical committee is taking, but there was still a number of unresolved questions. And going through the the email approach for a vote would, you know, require, you know, that to be 
written out for the record and um I, you know, I, th I think that would be be wise um, moving forward to do that rather rather than just as much as the confidence I have in the technical committee. You know, I'd like to kind of see the the final um, outcome, you know, in writing before and have an opportunity to just approve it that way for the record. Okay, thanks for that perspective, Nicola. Um, do we have any other hands? No additional hands at this time. Oh, here we go, Shanna Madsen. Okay, Shanna, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to say that I agree with Nicola. I think that's a good way forward. Um, I think what Jeff showed us today showed us that, um, you know, even depending on the combinations that were selected um, for the various, um, you know, the replacement values and the level of detection, we mostly fell out around the same level of percentage. Um, but I do think that an email vote would be nice so that we can see what the methodology is that's selected um, and just have all of that on the record. So just definitely in agree agreement with uh, Nicola. Okay, thanks, Shanna. I don't have any additional hands, Justin. Okay, um, we have a suggestion from Nicola Meserve, uh, sort of seconded by Shanna Madsen to go the email vote route. Uh, I'll just say to me, that does seem like a pretty reasonable approach. Uh, you know, it won't be sort of just putting it all in the technical committee's hands. It'll require some level of positive action by the board, but we'll avoid the, you know, potential difficulties of trying to have to schedule something like a board call to get everybody together. So it seems like a pretty reasonable path forward for me. I think I'll ask at this time if, if anybody on the board has any objection to taking that path forward. I see no hands raised in objection. All right, so seeing no hands raised, uh, we'll move forward with that pathway, uh, an email vote to approve the final percent reduction um, and consider that approved by consent. Okay, I think under this agenda item number four, I think we've wrapped up all the business we have to take care of. Uh, am I correct there, Tony? You are correct. All right, then I'll ask if there is any other business to come before this board today. Sorry, I was on mute. No additional hands. Okay, thanks. So given that, uh, this board stands adjourned. Thank you, everybody.